Hi everyone, I'm Cynthia Garrett and welcome back to another session. So if you were with us last week, then you know that um, we were knee deep in the middle of some really good conversation and fellowship with uh, this session's guest, Banning Liebscher. He is the founder, the director, and the head pastor of Jesus Culture, a movement that is just one of the most amazingly inspirational things I've seen sweep across the planet today. And um, I find myself always praying that God would bless them and favor them as they reach so many people, uh, myself included. So Banning, how are you? <laughs> oh, I'm so good. I'm good. I would say I'm here in sunny California, but as I look out my window, it's very English. It's kind of overcast and rainy, and so... Oh, that's awful. Uh, You're kidding. I, I, I know. I know. I can't believe it. But other than that, I'm fantastic. It's great to be with you. Always enjoy our conversations. Ditto. Same too, yes. So listen, we started last week. I mentioned that I really... I wanted to pick up this week and talk to you about your heart for race relations. And you and I have kind of touched on this. I know that you have a heart for it because my first Jesus Culture Conference uh, was in Long Beach, California, actually, this past year. And you had a, a guy there named John Gray who spoke to the subject of race. And um, I figured, ah, this is coming from Banning's heart. So yeah. how do we heal the world that we live in today? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I don't know if I have Jesus. That's my answer. Yeah, but, right. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think um, I grew up in a very um, kind of white community in a city, just a smaller city in California. So, um, but but early on, when the Lord began to uh, speak to us about mobilizing generation, my heart really became alive to that I wanted to see a generation actually um, mobilized, not just segments of it. And I think as I was reading. I began to, you know, Azusa Street, uh, which hit, uh, you know, L.A. in 1906, and really where the charismatic, you know, mo anybody that's got charismatic or Pentecostal roots can find their way back to Azusa Street somehow. But I remember reading a book. The Lord was stirring my heart on this, and there's a book called William Seymour by a guy named Greg Borlase. I think that's how you say his last name. Yeah. But one of the things he really touched on was how much when God came, how so much of the racial divide was healed and brought together and people were to lay down stuff. And, and uh, it just began to stir in my heart that we've got to see, um, again, I can mainly speak for the West. I can mainly speak for America. Uh, I don't know fully how it is in every other nation, but, but there is still, you know, racism still exists and there's still racial tension and the church is still a very segregated uh, place on Sunday mornings. And so I don't know if I have the answers, but I, I do know it's it's been on my heart and I feel like we need to have this conversation and we need to begin to move towards, because here's the reality. And I would say this in a few areas. I would say this in women in leadership. I would mm. say this, you know, with the, the race issue. We are better together, flat out. If we're going to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish as a body of Christ, um, then we're better together. We're more effective together. We're stronger together. I am better because of my connection to people that are different than me, that, that come from a different culture than me, that don't look exactly like me, that have different perspectives than me. And, and the, the evangelical world it's very fascinating to me, the statistics, it's something like 63% of evangelicals are uncomfortable having a conversation with somebody not like them. It's just astounding to me right. about how this has happened. So for me, um, you know, I, and, and Jesus culture was very, you know, we were reaching a very white audience um, and and I just, my heart, and we're still on this process, even as a church, my heart was just like, God, if you're going to fill stadiums across America, I don't want you just to fill them with suburban white kids. I, I want the body, I want a generation coming together, but, but there's a, there's a lot of hurdles involved with that, you know, and one of them being is that I, I don't think we listen real well, you know, um, I, I think that we don't just sit and listen. I don't think we know how to celebrate diversity. I, I think that we've had the concept that unity mm -hmm. looks like uniformity. Yeah. Or that, right. or that, and that unity is not uniformity. Unity is this incredibly beautiful, diverse picture yeah. of people whose hearts are connected and that we are able to celebrate one another and that, and that, and that we're okay leaning into that stuff. And so I can say a little bit for a Caucasian world, for white world, 
you know, we, we I, I'm not sure we, again, it's very hard to make general statements because I hate making general statements over a nation or the body of Christ, but we haven't been great at listening. We haven't been great at just sitting down and understanding where somebody from another race is coming from or what they're experiencing or to even think that they're experiencing something different than me, right. which they are. Right. So I just really believe this is our God's heart. I believe yeah. that we're to be one, that we really are one in Christ. Yeah. It just isn't manifesting yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a past to say, let's go see what are the hurdles? What, where do we need to humble ourselves? Where do we need to get rid of pride? Where do we need to, to, take, to take on the heart and really believe for justice? Yeah. I mean, there is some real injustice happening to people that don't look like me. Yeah. And what do I do about that? You know, what's my role and in, in how do I, you know, and, and, and like I said, we are, I am so much stronger with people around me. Yeah, we all are. And, and, yeah, so that, that's a little bit. I don't know if that, and I don't know if I fully have answers yet. I'm just on this journey and very much trying to just ask the Lord, Lord, what do we do with this? I know, obviously, without Jesus, you just can't do it, but. No, you're, listen, you're right. And I, I appreciate that you're on the journey and I appreciate that you're vocal about being on that journey as you were with me. You know, it's interesting because as I listened to you speak, the, the, the one thing that the Holy Spirit just shouted in my head was, yes, unity, yes, we're better together, but unity also begins with forgiveness. And yes. I, yes. when I speak to a lot of groups of uh, people of color, women of color, I, you know, it's funny. Uh, when I speak to women, I speak, to forgiveness. When I speak mm. to people of color, I speak to forgiveness yes. because you yes. have to. It's like, you know, forgiveness is the anchor. It's really hard to have that dialogue because yes. somebody has to be big enough first to stand up and say, I forgive you. And I was raised by a father who died in the year 2000 at around 78 years old, just to kind of reference the times he lived through. Um, he understood segregation. Yes, he was from the yes. South, you know, he lived through it. But it's interesting because when I asked him, Dad, what's the meaning of life? He, he, he replied with two answers. He said, well, honey, he said, people. People matter. You can't do anything without people. Doesn't matter what wow. color they are. This is a man who was 78 years old, a black man, right? Powerful. Yeah, yes. who, who had experienced racism that really crushed him in a number of ways. The second thing he said, and this was so powerful, and I, I just, I share it with you because your heart, I think, is important on this issue because of the position and the platform that you hold, because I think you can really do something with it. But what he said to me was, baby girl, you're a fool for the first 10 minutes that somebody does you a, a, a wrong. Cry about it, get, you know, be angry about it, but get it out of your system and get over it. Because after that first 10, 20 minutes, you have to get over it and take the hand that life has dealt you. And that's where your freedom comes from. And so you spoke to women in leadership. What do you think yeah. about this season for women in leadership? <laughs> <laughs> We're dealing with the hot, hot button topics. Well, yeah, let me say this no first. Manning, I, hot every, topics. Let's go. Let me say this. I, I so appreciate what you're saying um, around the race relations and the forgiveness, what your dad said. Just so much strengthens my own life is hearing that, something that's on our heart. Yeah, women in, lead, women in ministry, women in leadership, all that type of stuff. It, it's a similar thing for me in that I, I very much feel that the body of Christ, again, I can mainly only speak to Western world. I can mainly only speak to American, really, but... But I feel like much of the church has, is, is, we're just lacking in so many areas, I believe, because the, the female voice and female influence uh, has just not been allowed and has been removed. Yeah. And uh, I know that many people get there because of, uh, you know, in, in their heart, some an, kind of what they feel is an honest interpretation of scripture, whatever. And I have a deep, deep value for scripture. And so I, I, I've gotten to this place that I have of, you know, really believing that we need women in leadership and we need women's voice. I, I believe it's completely biblically based, but um, I just think we're hurt. I think we're hurting ourselves. <laughs> I, I think we're, and, and I, I think this, I, I think that if we are created in the image, male and female, that it's male and female that, that, that really portrays the image of God. Yep. And uh, um, and we're not seeing the full image of God. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or, you it, because. It, yeah. 
You're in right. the church, I, I don't think we're seeing the full image of God, and therefore we're not seeing the full impact that we can have uh, because uh, because of, for, you know, for whatever reasons, yeah. uh, it's just, a, at least in ministry world, it's very male, male-dominated and driven kind of environment. So I can just tell you for us and our church and our movement, we are way better uh, uh, and stronger and more effective because of the the influence and voice and strength and strategy and <laughs> Uh, of women. And, and so, and, you know, it's some of the most profound impact in my life. I mean, I, I'm preaching today because a lady named Iverna Tompkins came through and preached multiple times in my church and I was completely just wrecked and ruined. I mean, I would go to, I would be in college with cassette tapes and this is non-exaggeration. I would listen to her sermons so much. It would wear the tape out where all, it would get all warbly. Like pretty soon I couldn't use the tape anymore because I, I would just listen to the same, listen to her sermon so much over and over again as I was working. So I'm, I'm here today because I've heard Tompkins uh, just so impacted my life and inspired me that I said, I want to go preach. It's what I want to do. So, you know, I have a high value for that stuff. That's awesome. You, you know, it makes me think of, um, uh, a guest I had on a couple of sessions ago, and she and I spoke about, you know, effective, happy marriage and effective, happy parenting. And it really all revolved around an understanding of order, God's yeah. order. You know, there's God, Jesus, husband, wife, kids. And imagine running your home without your wife, CJ. I mean, uh, without her I, voice I, I, in the I mix. I shudder to think of that. I, it scares me. Yeah, yeah, no, you're exactly right. Anarchy, you know. Yeah, no, anarchy, <laughs> just complete. Right, yes. right. And so I tend to, look, obviously my husband and I are on the same page as you. It's, it's, it's why, yes. I mean, I happen yes. to believe that there's, there's not many greater scholars of the word than my husband, yet for some reason yeah. God gave me a, a couch and prepared me to work on TV yeah. that started in the it. secular world 20 years ago. Yes. But, you know, yeah. I mean, I couldn't do it without his support, you know, yeah. but, but our home is better with the voice of a male and a female in it. And uh, yes. we also happen to be a mixed race couple. You know, my husband is white and I'm black. So these are two issues that you are hot the buttons. Whole thing going on. <laughs> yeah. Listen, that's because God's that's because God's using you to really bring some uh, healing and clarity and direction and wisdom to these areas, which are which I think are really really needed. I have a heart for revival. I want to see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. These are two things that God is dealing with right now. Yeah. Um, and I think are very closely tied to us really seeing revival. Come on, I, I totally agree. So, you know, it was said to me recently um, by a youth pastor, who, who a, a, a woman that I actually adore, she's English, but she's there at Bethel. Um, mm -hmm. and she says hello, it was Carrie Lloyd, by the way. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, and Carrie said something and I just love it. And I asked her, I said, what are you seeing in youth today? And she said, well, she said, it kind of has to do with something we've talked about before, Cynthia. She said, I really do think that young people today are a lot of them are either all head knowledge or all heart knowledge. Yes. And I really wanted to put this one to you and ask you, how do we find the balance and, and teach them balance about this issue? Yeah, boy, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, I, I... <laughs> I think that you've got to encounter God. I, I think to really um, that 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 we want we want kids to encounter God, but they've got to be rooted deeply in the Word of God. So I don't know the balance. It's just do both fully. You know, <laughs> I, I think I think the balance in my I think balance is just do do the things you're supposed to do wholeheartedly. So just don't leave things out. That's more the balance concept for me. It's like. It's not either or, or it's not a mixture of the things. It's like, go after God with all of your heart and encounter him and then give yourself fully to be implanted in the word of God and know scripture and understand that truth comes from there. This is a big soapbox for me around this generation and, and, and not putting their roots in scripture or not having the foundation of the word of God and being led by feelings. Um, oh. so this is a whole nother, you know, we could have this conversation for sure yeah. about, about scripture and we're very much being led by feelings and the danger around that. But when it comes to balance, my balance is do, do, do what God's called you to do and do it all wholeheartedly. Yeah. <laughs> and just don't leave, just don't leave any of it out. Just, just don't forget about any of it. You know, you, 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 you kind of can't go wrong with that. I've got a couple of other quotes you made that I really, I, I, I love, and I want you to speak to this, um, 
The first one is we always want another word from the Lord, but what are you doing with the one you have? Yes, yes, because we're wanting to go from like experience to experience. So I love when God speaks to me again. I mean, everything is found, everything is rooted in scripture, but when the Lord prophetically speaks to me, when he speaks to my heart, like I love it, it's, it's, this is awesome. But the Bible is very clear that if you want something to increase, you have to do something with what you have. And so, you know, I have to do something with the talents in my hand. I have to do something with the word that I have. I have to be faithful with something in order for it to increase. So for me, I think sometimes we just want another word. And I'm like, you don't need another word. You need to go do something with one you have, <laughs> you know? And, and, and I would say a lot of people, it's so, a similar concept with teaching. I'd say a lot of the Western church, they don't need more teaching. They just need courage to do what God's told them to do. Like we're wanting like, give me more teaching. I want more teaching. I want more teaching. I'm like, or you can, or you just need courage. This is one of the reasons why the, the, the mandate I feel in my life is just to encourage people is to give them courage to go do what God's called them to do. Mm. I mean, of course we need teaching, but we're a very overtaught society. Mm. I'm like, like, you don't need more teaching. You need to go do what God's called you to do. You don't need more prophetic words. You need to go do something with what he's already said to you. So it's kind of an action thing. This is one of the quotes I, this is the sarcastic quote I have, but I've always been intrigued working at the school ministry in, in Bethel for years. I was always intrigued by why, by, by how people could have the same encounter and then they could leave and have a word. And some people would go out and really, you know, be doing stuff for God and others kind of wouldn't. They just kind of, you know, uh, uh, kind of fall, falter down. And, and I was always wondering, and then I just realized, as simple as this is, that the difference between, this is the, what I say, the difference between people that do something and people that don't do something is the people that do something, do something. <laughs> like, it, it, it's, it's just that type of simple. It's like we're kind of waiting around for another thing, never doing anything. I'm like, no, like, if you want to do something, go do something. Like, this is what separates people is that there's a lot of people who aren't doing anything. You wonder why they're not doing anything? Because they're not doing anything. <laughs> it's like, just, and, and, and it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be grandiose. It, like, just go do something simple. Just be doing something and moving forward and stop waiting for just another word, even though I want words, right? I'm asking the Lord right now for some real clear prophetic direction. I need the word of the Lord in my life, so. <laughs> Here's a word for you. You already know the voice of the Lord. You yes. know what he's told you. <laughs> that's, totally, that, that's the truth right there. That's the, <laughs> Reinhard, yeah. Reinhard Bonnke said, uh, you know what faith looks like? If you're believing to walk, it looks like putting one foot in front of the other that's and actually walking. Exactly right. And that's that you're exactly right. And so that's what I'm talking about. People are wanting a word. I'm like, just take the word you had and take a step. Yeah. You'll find you'll find the word you want. You'll find that word as you keep moving. I love just it. keep moving, you know. I love it. Um, another quote you made, which I think is phenomenal. I'm greatly concerned with a generation whose Christianity has cost them nothing. If it hasn't cost you anything, it may not be worth anything. Oh uh, yeah, this is a tough one. We have, uh, we have people, again, Jesus paid a great price. So, so Jesus paid a great price on the cross. I don't earn my salvation. I can't work for it, but, but he makes it so, but salvation is a free gift, true statement, but it will cost me my life. So, so he gives me the gift of salvation, but he requires my life from me. And, and so we kind of want a Christianity that doesn't really cost me anything. Like, I don't want to lose any friends, and, and I, don't, I don't want to have to give this up, or I don't want to have to go do this, or I don't want to be uncomfortable, or I don't want to be inconvenienced. And I'm like, what kind of Christianity are we doing here when nothing's required of us? <laughs> yes, like, right. nothing... And like somehow, if you read scripture, it's the exact opposite. Jesus was, uh, again, I heard a preacher talk about this one time, that Jesus was, pheno he was phenomenal at making it very hard to stay and easy to leave. So Jesus would be with people and um, he'd get 15,000 people on a hillside. And I mean, if I get 15,000 people to show up to my meeting, it's, I've arrived. This is it, man. I like he'd get 15,000 people and then he'd say the most offensive thing you could say to a Jewish culture. He would say, if you, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to take, have a part in me and be my disciple, you have to drink my blood and eat my flesh. Oh. And, and, and he wouldn't explain it. Right. He didn't explain it. Like we read it and we're like, oh, you know, 
He, he wouldn't be like, it's allegorical, it's symbolic. It, it, I, I'm actually talking about grape juice and a wafer. Like, yeah, <laughs> he, he, he wouldn't explain it. He would say, if you want a part of me and be my disciple, you have to drink my blood and my flesh. And people were like, that's too much. I don't, uh, it's just, it's, it, it's just, it's out there. It's, it's, it, you know, it's gross. It's offensive. It's, I can't do it. And they would all leave. 15,000 would leave. Jeez. And then he turned to his disciples and he like, are you guys going too? And they, you know, they're like, we'd like to, but you're the only one that has the words of life. Where else are we going to go? And if I'm Peter, I'm telling Jesus, hey, listen, we could keep a lot bigger crowd if you just kind of tone down some of that drink my blood, eat my flesh stuff. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but following Jesus, man, you, it, it costs me something. Mm. It really does. I mean, to get the pearl of great price, and to get the, the, the treasure hidden in the field, we sell everything for it. Mm -hmm. Now, again, what I'm getting in return, that's why I've got to know he, uh, that's why I've got to encounter him. Because when I encounter him, it's with joy that I sell everything for the pearl of great price. It's with joy that I sell, but I still have to sell everything. <laughs> this is the whole concept. <laughs> I do it with joy because of what I get, but to act like I don't have to sell my reputation and sell my convenience and sell my comfort and sell my time and sell, like to, to think that I don't have to sell everything in order to get the treasure hidden in the field. I'm just trying to get a generation to see how valuable that treasure is and that it's worth my life. It's worth everything I have. Great. And um, so that's, that's really, that's why I, that's the thing for me of like, if I look around and be like, yeah, you know, my Christianity hasn't really cost me anything. Yeah. I'm never inconvenienced. I'm never not comfortable. I've never had to, you know, walk away from something. I have all my same friends. I have all my same, you know, everything. I'm like, uh. What's the point? Like, I, <laughs> like I, this is not what Jesus calls us to. Oh, man, that's so good. I, I don't know if you know Philip Mantofa or not. Um, he's a, a pastor in Indonesia and he's, I mean, he's, you know, he's got a huge, huge, huge ministry. And I, I mean, and I know why it's because of the brokenness and the humility of his heart condition before the Lord. And he was yeah. here visiting last summer and he said something to me that just, I mean, it rocked my world. And, and he said this being in Indonesia, he's on ISIS's hit list. He, yeah. uh, he, 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 he's in such danger all the time. And I said, you know, it's unbelievable. And in the Western church, you know, I, I, I you know, I feel like, well, what hotel accommodations are we going to be in yes. when we get there for the conference? You know, that kind of stuff. And he, yes. he looked at me and he said, but Cynthia, he said, you see, he goes, I believe that God is doing what he's doing in the, the Asian church to in, in, inspire the Western church to jealousy. He said, oh. because for us, if Jesus isn't worth dying for, he's not yes. worth living for. Yes, oh, so powerful. Come on, that will, that's a, that's a mic drop. I was like, oh, I'm done. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, it's true. And again, this is something we deal with in the Western church, but it's so true. And, and we just are, we're just so, we deal with such trivial things, you know. Mm -hmm. Our first we, we so, we, Yeah, we so wrestle with sacrifice in a way that's just, you know, I had a friend who was deployed to Afghanistan and Iraq, and missionaries will go through this too. When they come back in, it's a lot of culture shock coming back in because they're in such intense environments. And he was, he was just telling me, he goes, it's really hard. He's over there in Iraq and, you know, especially in the early days of that. He says, you're coming back, you're standing in line at Starbucks, and somebody's complaining about their coffee's not hot enough. <laughs> you know, and, and it's just that kind of thing. And, and we, and, and we kind of can fall into that sometimes, like, ugh. I don't want to have to go to, a, you know, we have three services on Sunday, you know, and so the, uh, the, this is the most convenient one. I don't want to have to go to the 8.30 one. It's just so inconvenient, you know, it's just so inconvenient. And I'm like, God, man, we're, again, our church isn't, but it, that's that type of thing that yeah. sometimes in the Western church, it's like, I don't want to get up two hours early. Yeah. Like, it just it don't inconvenience me at this level. Yeah. And we don't even realize how, like, I want my coffee really hot. Why is it not so hot? You know? Like, yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we're getting, look, I think we're in for, or we're getting hopefully blessed with a bit of a wake up call because in reality, I see that we've taken our ability to freely worship and freely be Christians completely for granted. And it's not yeah. until you lose the freedoms to be that or until the freedoms to be that are threatened that you actually begin to count the cost yes. of what you actually have. You, no, you're right. You know? You're right. So listen, so it, we're in closing. Would you kind of 
make an appeal uh, because I'm always I'm always uh, constantly taken back to our first job, which is to evangelize the lost. So yeah. would you kind of close us with something for all of the people watching? Well, I, I will tell you this, that we were created to be in relationship with God. This is where, this is the only place that we'll find true satisfaction in. And you'll never find satisfaction. You'll never truly find who you are apart from Christ. And he, he Again, when we talk about the cross, he died on the cross. This is when God sent his son to die on the cross, it's because he loves you so passionately and so deeply. And, and this is the beautiful thing that I, before Christ, I was dead and now I'm alive. Uh, and listen, if you're watching right now and you've never put your faith in Christ, if you don't know, if you, if you were to die today, would I spend eternity in heaven or would I spend eternity in hell? If you're not confident of that, you can know that today. Also, if you don't know why you're alive, if you've never experienced the forgiveness of Christ, if you've never experienced the love that the Father has for you, if you've never experienced that I was dead, now I'm alive, I, I had no hope and now I have hope, I had no peace and now I have peace. Those are all, Jesus is the living hope, Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and it is a free gift. He died on a cross so that you could find yourself complete in him and also spend eternity with him. And, and the reason why we're so happy, the reason why Cynthia and I have such huge smiles on our faces, is not because everything's perfect, but because we have found the one or he found us that loves us deeply. And there's a confidence in our relationship with him. So I would encourage you, just, just pray. In fact, I'll just pray with you right now. Like I, I would just, if you're home right now and you have never put your faith in Christ or maybe you're away from God, you're not right with God, you know you've been living your own thing, just, just pray this with me. We just say, say, Father, we accept the gift of Jesus. We thank you that your son was sent to die on a cross to forgive me of my sins. And, and I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and that, that I would encounter the love that you have for me. I want to know the hope and the peace and the joy that is found only in Jesus. And then I pray that, that you would experience God in a deep way. Uh, that, that I just pray for everybody watching right now that you would experience God in a deep way, that you would encounter the truth of his love for you and it would truly set you free in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mm, amen. Banning. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's been good to be with you. Man, thank you. Bless you. You are a rock star. Any way we could ever serve you, just ask. I appreciate that. Thanks for watching, you guys. You've been a part of an amazing session. I'm Cynthia Garrett. Gotta go. See you next time. Hi, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed today's session. I'm sitting here with my husband because we're going to do a really quick recommend. Um, and it's a book that I've just written called Prodigal Daughter, A Journey Home to Identity. It's available online at booksellers everywhere. And um, it's my journey, as he knows, through all of the things that God has taught me, through all of the things that I've gone through in my life. And a lot of them I speak about in my teachings. And there are challenges that we all face every day that we can all overcome. And we overcome everything and we change the world around us by walking in the power of our identity. That's my hope for each and every one of you. And I love you and I'll see you on the next session.